So excited to get started today. So we just don't want to waste any time because we know there's going to be a lot of conversation and a lot of interesting things to hear and listen and, and discuss. So without further ado, welcome again to the, for those of you who were not with us last night, it was a excellent, excellent, excellent um, talk by Dr. Wang. And we are, um, is it Wang? I'm sorry. Um, and we're very excited to hear uh, the plenary speakers today. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we have, we are doing, we are experimenting a little bit with technology today. So Poll Everywhere will be um, text messaging answers to certain questions that uh, either the committee has posted or the plenary speakers have wanted to ask. Uh, you all, and so we can all visually see what's happening. Um, so Robbie will, will, will go through that and we'll do a test question before everything gets started. Um, the other thing is, uh, and it's up right now, the Guest Northwestern, please if you want to log into the Guest Northwestern Pass, you have a white piece of paper in your packet of information to show you and tell you how to do that. And we can, we'll walk you through that process in just a second. Um, but you can certainly read that and do it yourself. And, uh, feel free to do that now so you're all set up when we get to the Poll Everywhere question. Um, and the other thing is that I'm Erin Dragato, <laughs> Executive Director of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. And um, we're honored to co-collaborate on this uh, second annual symposium highlighting the achievements of women in science in the hopes to pave the way um, while increasing the pipeline. Some of you may or may not know, and some of you heard this last night, but um, more R&D funded research occurs within the 300 mile radius of the Chicagoland area, and then the coasts combined, and that includes Silicon Valley and the MIT area. So um, as this is a st staggering statistic, it makes sense if you take into account the, the national laboratories, the academic institutions, and the industry who all receive uh, this type of funding, literally in our backyard. So um, our mission, the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, is to raise the awareness of, of science and technology developments, pulling research out of the lab, showcasing it to the public, and um, uh, in, the, in and around the Chicagoland region. And we're glad women in science is a part of that process. Um, and we do this by m partnering with all those major um, organizations that I've mentioned, uh, National Labs, Academic, and Industry, um, highlighting current research and innovation in these fields. As you know uh, very well, that women in the sciences are very much a part of the landscape, uh, and in order to continue to broaden the spectrum of leaders in, in science and technology, we, along with our sponsors and organizational par partners, are dedicated to making sure women are women are part of the infrastructure. And I do want to um, say a special word of thanks to our sponsors, Argonne, uh, Blue Star Energy, Motorola Solutions, Abbott, the Shreesheim Fund, Museum of Science and Industry Chicago, Baxter, Physical Sciences of the University of Chicago, Physical Sciences Division in the University of Chicago, Fermilab, uh, DePaul University, ARCS Foundation, Sigma Psi, AWIS, Association for Women in Science, and it's um, uh, University of Illinois Chicago, Women in Science and Engineering, or WISE, and uh, University of Chicago CAPS, uh, Career Advising and Planning Services. And some have tables outside, so please visit um, those tables as you pass by for uh, during our breaks and our networking luncheon as they have great information to share with you as well. Um, so with that, welcome to this, what is to be an exciting day. And um, finally, I'm just here to introduce a friend, colleague, and co-chair to the symposium with, without whom uh, I would have probably passed out by now. Um, Director of Science and Integrated Strategies at Museum of Science and Industry Chicago, Dr. Robbie Amayas. Good morning. Who's ready for an exciting, exciting day of science? Yay! I work at a museum, so uh, that's a little bit more my style. 
Welcome, everyone. This is really an exciting weekend for us, and I echo uh, Aaron's sentiments that this is just a fantastic opportunity to be a part of this rich community of women in science in Chicago. Um, and also a special shout out to the male supporters who are in the crowd today. We don't uh, overlook you as well. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I'm uh, from the Museum of Science and Industry, and Hello. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> on behalf of the museum, we are really uh, proud to be one of the sponsors of this event this weekend. Uh, the mission of the museum is quite different um, from perhaps the mission of, of some of your organizations, but we are really focused on sparking creativity and innovation in young people to help them fulfill their full potential in science, technology, engineering, and medicine. And so for us, participating in Women in Science is a really great opportunity to strengthen and support the network of women scientists who are the role models and the examples for the youth that we're serving every day. So this is just a tremendous extension of our vision, and we're really pleased to be a part. I have a little bit of kind of fun housekeeping uh, information for you all this morning. So just wanted to walk through very briefly how today is going to go and how we're going to be using your cell phone. So while the signs behind me have been saying, please silence your cell phone, we don't want you to turn them off. Um, because we will, as Aaron mentioned, be soliciting some information from you all during the day to get your feedback, to um, guide some of our discussion, and so that all of you can maybe learn a little bit more about the women and men who are here in the audience. So um, to start off, why don't we do a quick test of our system. So I'm going to switch out of here. Ben showed me how to do this, and I will promise to not embarrass him. So has anyone used Poll Anywhere before or any type of online text messaging system? A couple of people? Great. So it's a really fun way to learn a little bit about who is in the audience. And so here's how it works. Those of you who have cell phones, it does not need to be a smartphone. It can be a, a feature phone as long as you have either a 3G connection or a wireless connection. And what will happen is that as we're asking questions during the day, the question will show up on the screen at the top there. So our first kind of test question for the morning is what is your primary affiliation? And the options that we have are university, corporation, nonprofit, foundation, industry, government, or national laboratory. So if you could find the category that most uh, best represents your affiliation, and what you would do in your phone is in the to field, so where you might put someone's name or someone's phone number, you would put in 22333. So that's what you would put in your to line, your address line. We're going to walk. Oh, look, people are fast. OK. So once you figure that out, your response that you're choosing is the number next to the response. So if you're choosing non-for-profit, you might pick 347808 and send the message. I love when this happens. So this, with about a three or four second delay, you're seeing responses in real time. If you try to answer twice, the system will text you back and say, no, thank you. And so for, for these types of multiple choice questions, what you'll see is that the bar graph will update in real time with the frequency of your responses. If anyone's having trouble accessing the system or working it out, if you just kind of raise your hand, we can help you out. Sometimes it takes a little while to figure it out the first time. Excellent. This is so exciting. OK. so. Um, so great. So we'll be using this a couple of times during the day, just so that everyone knows these are standard text message rates. So whatever your text messaging plan uh, accommodates, that's what you would be charged or billed for um, in this case. So we're going to go ahead and stop this poll, but it's great to kind of see who's in our audience today. We've got a really large university population, some from industry, national labs, and then nonprofit and corporation. So it's a nice way to learn a little bit more about who's in the room, and we'll be doing that a couple other times. OK? All right, so we're going to stop that one. So if you are start trying to send now, it's going to not allow you to send anymore. So you can go ahead and stop. So let's just do a quick question about today. So this symposium is big ideas, big impact. And so the question that we'd all like to ask you on behalf of the steering committee is what impact are you hoping to have today? So this is a free response question. So in this case, you would put to your subject I'm sorry, into your address field, you would uh, type in the number, and then you can type in whatever response you'd like in the, in the message field. So whatever your response might be, you can go ahead and type that in. So in this case, you would put 22333 in the to line, in the address line. And then in your message, you would put the number 347820 first, 
and then type in your response. So this one's a little more tricky, so we wanted to practice. Is that clear for everybody? So 22333 is in the address line, and then in your message, 347820, and then your response. Oh, awesome. These are also anonymous. We can't track you, so please understand that we, <laughs> we will be keeping the responses for documentation, but they are completely uh, anonymous. So great, so we've got networking. I want to see some bad A ladies. Awesome. Learn how to approve the pipeline. Somebody from AWIS is giving them a shout out. Meet some outstanding scientists. I want to... You all are doing a great job. I was a little worried. With kids get this right away, sometimes with grown ups it's a little bit trickier. So well done ladies, well done. Excellent. So hopefully everybody sees how this works. Again, we'll have some multiple choice, some free response questions, and we'll be able to kind of see what some of those are. Great ideas for mentoring, networking with amazing women. There will be lots of opportunity for that today. All right. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and stop that poll in a couple of seconds. Oh, they're still coming. Okay, we want to capture them all. So how about, if you're still sending in responses, please feel free to do that. Let me give you a little bit of a quick overview on how today is going to run. We have three really exciting sessions with three speakers each. And so each of our speakers will come up and speak for uh, roughly eight, 17 or 18 minutes. And then we'll have question and answer for each speaker individually. At the end of the third speaker, we'll invite all three of our speakers up to sit at the table. And then you all are, have another opportunity to ask questions of them as a panel. For your orientation, there are two microphones in the audience. There's one to your left um, in the stairs, so please be mindful of the stairwell. And then there's another microphone to your left here at the front on the bottom level. So if you have questions, feel free to come and stand up at the end of the presentations and form a small line. And we will have a member of the steering committee here to help direct questions as needed. OK? Any questions? Ready to get started, right? OK. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and ask one more that is relevant to today's session one, which is entitled Game Changers. So what does a game changer mean to you? In whatever field that means, whether that's in your personal space, in your work, in science, what does being a game changer mean to you? Again, your address line is 22333, and your response will be preceded by 347923. I want to get my phone and answer too, but <laughs> changing the dogma, making a difference. Taking risks and being confident in your abilities. So great. Thinking outside the box, <laughs> shifting paradigms, bringing something new making a difference, being successful in a man's world, changing minds about science, redefining the language of success, improving the environment for women in STEM fields. Another thinking outside the box. Revolution, not evolution. Mythbuster. Rewriting the rules. Game changers break the rules and craft a better world. Fantastic, ladies. Right, any last minute submissions? Oh yeah, inspiring others to follow in our footsteps, making it easier for those who come after you. That touches really nicely on something Dr. Huang said last night. Inspiring and being inspired by strong women in STEM, breaking through barriers, doing something meaningful and impacting, making a difference. Finding a way that works better than present methods, challenging dogma, fantastic. All right, we're going to go ahead and close that poll. This is fantastic. Thank you for walking through this and for, oh, excellent, high impact discoveries. Okay. All right. Well, I will leave that running while we introduce our first speaker and then we will close it down for the presentation. But let me first briefly summarize this first session this morning. As I mentioned, session one is Game Changers, Redefining the Landscape. We have three wonderful speakers who will be talking about this topic today. Increasingly at the forefront of science and tech and engineering fields, women are making extraordinary impact 
on both the scientific community and the general public. Our panel of experts will discuss how their leadership and vision has been critical to changes in environmental policy, academic research, and engaging youth in STEM pathways within the scope of their work. So without further ado, I introduce to you our first speaker for this morning, Suzanne Malik McKenna, who is Senior Counsel to Jaskalska Terman and Associates and Director of the Regional Trees Initiative at the Morton Arboretum. Howdy. Is this working? Yes. It is. See, we're already beginning with technology. That's exciting. Except my little clip came off, so I'm just going to carry it. How is everybody this morning? Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so I am going to talk this morning about um, some of the things uh, I've worked on when I was at the Department of Environment how that's transitioning, those experiences are transitioning into the types of things I'm doing now. Um, what I think is, do we have a remote? Are we remoting? No? All right. Um, I'm going to start with uh, something that's been near and dear to my heart and something that is scientifically, politically, and um, community-based. Uh, indeed, if it's going to be successful, and that's the Climate Action Plan. So I'm going to lay out some of the efforts we've undertaken, how we've engaged communities, and then how we're going to be applying it um, in new um, prospects. I think one of my key messages to you today will be, you know, as a scientist, um, what are you trying, we talked about game changers, what are we trying to change? And how, who's your audience, first of all, because if you're trying to change something, you can be in your little room, and that's great. But somehow you're going to need to communicate uh, whatever type of science you're working on. Uh, and if you want it to be a game changer, you need the results of what you're doing, either successes or failures, to, for people to be aware of those things so that you're sharing and extending knowledge about what you're working on. Um, so, so how do you communicate that? Um, I think there's a range of different ways, and it, it definitely depends on who you're speaking to. So I saw a few things up here about, um, and I see there are a few um, people of the male gender, so I'll only pick on you just a little bit. Um, but depending on who you're speaking to, your message changes. It doesn't mean that you're the subject, the, the, the core of what you're trying to get across changes, but how you present it will. Um, we were just talking about that with this great team from University of Chicago. Um, that if we're, if we're going to engage people, we need to speak their language and insert the message and the science uh, and the things we want to achieve through the, the type of messages they'll actually listen to. Um, I was lucky enough to be at the Nobel uh, Laureate Summit. Uh, one of my gigs is just Golka Terman, and they, they worked on that. And so we had the Dalai Lama and Gorbachev. I mean, it was just mind-blowing. But um, somebody asked, and it was mostly high school students, they were trying to engage people in, in thinking about peace and how they can um, advance that um, in this next generation. And they, some student asked, how do we, if somebody just won't listen to me, if somebody's just going to argue with me, you know, what do you do? And the Dalai Lama said, well, Buddha would say, interesting. <laughs> he wouldn't argue. And he said, too many people are this and not enough this, right? And so, and Gorbachev said the same thing, who, by the way, was the one who spoke the most about environment and sustainability. It was really interesting. Um, so so it's, it's your perspective. It's, it's taking a look at who you're trying to communicate with, what change, what kind of game you're trying to change, and who the players are going to be in order to make that happen. Climate Action Plan would be an example of this. Uh, we worked with the International Panel on Climate uh, Change, um, two of our scientists, one from University of Illinois, one from Texas Tech, who helped us do a forecast of what the Chicago region was going to look like. First, you need to understand what your emissions are. Um, in the city, uh, we knew that we had about 34.6 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent 
70% in buildings and energy uses, 21% in transportation, the other 9% a lot about waste and industrial pollution. In the region, uh, you can see buildings go from 70 to 61, transportation 30 to 21. Why would that be? 21 to 30, I mean. Why? Less public transit, right? Um, a dense community is typically a more environmentally friendly community, um, making use of the green spaces so that they provide those ecosystem services and a, a range of things. So I don't like to, so here's an example of communication. I don't like to scare the bejesus out of people. Because typically when you do, the ears close, the eyes shut, and people walk away. They, well, what should I do then? I mean, what's the point? We're going to go to hell, so we might as well just live it up now, right? But the reality is, higher emission scenario, we're going to see 31 days of 100 plus degree temperature. Um, and um, about 90 days of 90 plus degree uh, days. Um, the lower emission scenario is eight days of 100 plus degree uh, temperature, um, Fahrenheit. So needless to say, we'd like the lower emission scenario. And in order to do that, you have to engage, you have to have scientifically rigorous um, information, and then you need to figure out how you're going to advance the work that needs to take place, and that's about getting people uh, working with you to figure out what roles they might play. The goal of the Climate Action Plan is to reduce our emissions to 25% below 1990 levels by 2020. 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. Seems absolutely ridiculously daunting. I am a ridiculous positivist. So, hey, why can't we? And 2020 is a goal, you know, that's eight years from now. How, how can we get there? And then the first several years of um, effort, we're, we've, we're seeing some benefit. Um, the economy has actually helped. Of course, you have less development and a range of things, but that's just a false bit of data and we need to be thinking about where we're going to go with this. So that's our goal um, and we were just talking about density. Um, as you can see, did I get a really cool laser thing? Oh, don't worry about it. I'll point. It's okay. I love technology. I love little light things. But anyway, I'll get over it. So on the left, this slide is about the concentration of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions in the city, right? If you look at per capita basis on the right, it's in the suburbs. It's in the collar counties. Energy use, inefficiency, uh, transportation, all these different types of things. So who's our audience? It's definitely the people downtown. But it's also a huge opportunity in the collar counties as we're looking at development, um, as we're looking at uh, the science that we're undertaking, that's looking at renewable energies, et cetera. Here are the key things that um, we're undertaking through the Climate Action Plan. As you can see, 70% of our Emissions are energy related, so needless to say, a lot of energy efficiency, improved transportation, clean and renewable energy advancement, uh, waste industrial processes, and adaptation, which I think is something a lot of people don't think about. When we started the implementation, our city departments, there were 20 departments and agencies saying, huh, what's adaptation? Because adaptation oftentimes is mitigation, um, reducing carbon dioxide emissions, but adaptation is also forecasting, all right, 20 years from now, what tree is going to survive? What trees aren't going to survive? What invasive species are going to come uh, to the region? And how do we prep for that? Um, so all those types of things, in addition to increased uh, water, rain events, et cetera. You're just, you just give and give and give. Thank you very much. I just have to, all right, got it. So when you think about adaptation, um, this is the 1990 hardiness zone map. Um, we were what's called 4B5A at the time in the Chicago region. Um, certain types of plants live here based on temperature change, precipitation, et cetera. 16 years later, 5B6A. We are Champaign-Urbana now. Okay, we are central Illinois, based on temperature, uh, based on a range of things that, that put together our hardiness zone. That's a problem. And we are now seeing species that we can grow here. And I went to U of I in horticulture, so I'm like, sweet gum, excellent. It's not excellent, it's a bad thing. Um, but it's also reality. So um, instead of saying, oh my god, we can't plant these trees anymore, what are our new species that we're going to be introducing as part of it? Water. I love this example because this is a women in science example. Uh, Janet Deterian at Department of Transportation is just a sustainability 
infrastructure rock star. And she pushed the city to look at green alleys, so alleys that are more permeable. We waste a lot of our water sending it into the sewer systems. Um, so we tried all different kinds of things, but now we have permeable asphalt and concrete that's also high albedo, highly reflective. We have a um, one-mile example along Blue Island in Cermak. It's one mile long. Um, it has high albedo, permeable asphalt and concrete. All of the energy, the lights, et cetera, are um, solar. The, the, it's not connected to the sewers, so it's bioinfiltration and a range of things that captures the water and is used for the landscape and the local school, the nearby school. Um, my favorite part, because uh, it makes me sound scientific, is the photocatalytic concrete um, surface, which is able to grab the emissions for the first, I think it's the eight-foot column, and make it benign uh, when it heats up and when, when there's solar engagement. If I describe that wrong, you can all take care of me later. But we now have 200 alleys. We have 2,000 miles of alleys in the city of Chicago, so we got a way to go. What we're finding is if homes then direct their stormwater to the alleys, we're only using one-third of the capacity in these alleys. When we have extreme storm events, climate, uh, and other issues, we overflow our sewers, we get raw sewage backup, we have to open up the 220 outlets to the Chicago River, sometimes to the lake. These are important issues. And technology is helping design it. And as we do it, we're bringing down the unit cost price, the economics of it, to make it actually feasible. No matter what, you have to engage human beings, <laughs> whether it's government, community, uh, corporate, what have you. So how do we do that? Um, this is an example of an effort that we, under, uh, we, we started a few years ago called the Energy Action Network. As you can see, all those dots um, are uh, different types of activities. We've got all the little blue um, uh, triangles are Chicago Conservation Corps leaders. It's a program we started in 2006. We now have 300 people across the city, all different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, all different careers, doctors, lawyers, uh, janitors, all over the city. They went through five classes. They learned about air, water, waste, energy, and community organizing. Did asset-based development um, assessments, et cetera. And now they're carrying out work in their communities. And now, I mean, that's just, that, that, those dots are from a couple years ago. We c connected those with our Chicago Conservation Corps after-school clubs. 90 mostly high schools and junior high level students. And they're doing wastewater energy and doing projects in their community. Um, Field Museum, uh, through their echo group, um, Environment, Culture, and Conservation, a division of the Field Museum that's working on that community uh, environment interaction, uh, was involved with us doing ethnographic work, uh, really looking at communities in depth. Then you have Department of Public Health that's doing lead abatement. Department of Community Development doing a range of uh, emergency housing repair. All those groups together, and we linked them all, number one, to reduce um, disconnections by helping them with helping residents with bill payment. Uh, number two, uh, by getting involved, getting people involved in doing energy efficiency. Um, and then starting to address other issues while you're at it. So if we we're in doing lead, we started talking about energy and water and those types of things. Um, the volunteer aspect alone in um, each year, over the past three years, uh, these groups weatherized 6,000 homes each season. Volunteers, Conservation Corps leaders, Energy Action Network leaders, and conservation clubs, working with some ex-offender programs um, that we started as well. 6,000 homes. Now, to be clear, they did about 8,000 homes, but we could track and demonstrate 6,000 of them. That's a lot of homes. And that was involving the community, and it's demonstrating I get a little tired of the Emily Mead saying, you know, don't think that an individual can, you know, change the world. Indeed, they're the only ones that ever have. Great. It's true to a certain extent, but it's also, it's, it's to a lot of extent, let's be clear. But it's that community engagement, it's that integration of those leaders, and it's the development of new leaders over time that can make it happen. So you tell, oh, laser is not going to do it. That's not going to move my slides. This is. Other activities, we have a program called Roll Out the Barrel. I love that name. Um, anybody catch that? Hello, everybody here. Um, and so uh, about 3,000 rain barrels have been installed in people's homes. These are 55-gallon drums. 
You can disconnect your downspout. You can do it on all four downspouts. You use that water to wash your car, uh, you know, water your landscape. Again, water that's not going into the sewers. Teaching people how to do it, getting people in the community involved in it. They become knowledgeable. They become ambassadors for the type of activities, and they make it accessible to the communities to undertake it. Another quick example is South Chicago. Uh, so we took all these things and we went to one community. Uh, this one community, I got to remember this, 8,000 residential units on the southeast side in the Calumet region, uh, mostly low income, uh, mostly Hispanic, with uh, a couple sections of Haitians. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting community. And we brought all these groups to bear to look at how we could do a full scale set of energy efficiency, both the community based weatherization, et cetera. Our goal was. 70% um, of the homes being retrofitted, or 1,200, no, 70% of, of the homes being impacted somehow, 1,200 out of those 8,000 being retrofitted. It was 1,200 by 2012. Um, this, the groups came together, mapped the area. These are some of the specific areas that we were going to target where it didn't have as many activities from weatherization to lead abatement to the range of different things going on in the region. And these partners came together. Uh, all in the community, all excited, put together their partnership, looked at how they do the outreach. And here are some of the projects they started. Green literacy, green and corn, greens and corn red summits, from steel to green, pollution to solution, retrofit door to door, outreach to the Togolese and French speaking communities. This, this was not, we're from government, we're here to help. They knew the resources available. They came up with the creativity in order to make the work happen. Um, that is really exciting because what you're doing is you're aligning missions, you're leveraging resources, you're bringing about action. It requires oftentimes um, negotiation. Um, you were supposed to give me two. Did you already give me two? Yeah. Damn. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Quickly, um, how do you apply this stuff? So I'm just, um, I'm kind of heavy into my dissertation right now. I'm defending on Wednesday. And, uh, <laughs> whoo, almost done. And it's about, trust and coalition building amidst change in Chicago communities. So from the North Kenwood Oak and Bronzeville community where thousands of public housing units have been torn down, to the Polish community, which is seeing a major out-migration to the suburbs, to Forest Glen, a more moderate to upper income white community on the Northwest side. How do they each deal with change? How do they form coalitions to make things happen? I'm now applying it to a new gig that I'm working on, the Regional Trees Initiative. What we're trying to do within the CMAP region, Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, seven counties, is um, look at our tree population. Um, they are hurting. We have something called emerald ash borer that's in the next several years is going to probably five max kill all the ash trees in the Chicago region. 20% in the city of Chicago are ash. Um, it's a huge problem. Trees within one season fall apart, literally just fall apart because the borers go in and make the tree um, structurally unsound. Um, crisis is a terrible thing to waste. How do we take that and engage people around trees overall? Climate adaptation, what species we need to choose. How do we all get together and have um, a, a better uh, leveraging for acquiring trees? All these things can happen, bring groups together, help them achieve their goals, whether it's a forest preserve district, a corporate landscape, a municipality that has hazard issues on their trees, on their parkways, bring them together, have an economic driver for the nursery industry, et cetera, who are biting the dust with the, the dip in development, and then um, come up with a plan that helps everybody achieve their missions. Climate adaptation is a key aspect of that. So I'm going to ignore all that. Um, happy trees will contribute when you put together the leadership, lead an implementation strategy, and bring about peace and happiness. Um, so all I'm going to say about that and everything else is that in order to carry out this work, you have to look at those audiences. And, and my example up there is kind of crazy. Um, I like sloth. That's one of my favorite. Forever student. There's nobody here like that. Um, Ex-offender, dentist, bus driver. You know, these are all the people that we need to engage to make things happen. These are the people that need to understand the science you're undertaking, the importance of that science, and why we need to continue to support it. And the process we undertake, first you've got to get people to even be aware of what's going on. And I never use the word educate, because I think that that is 
um, that's judgmental. You're, you're dumb, so I'm going to educate you. I'm going to raise awareness. I'm going to get the word about, out. I want people to understand what's going on. Once you do that, can you get people to have a sense of ownership? Build those stakeholders around the work. Once they do that, can they engage in the discussion and ultimately can they take action? Based on that science, based on that data you have, to be the game changers, to change the way we're operating in the region and beyond, to make the things happen that we know need to happen. So that's what I have to say. And I look forward to talking to you later. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. OK. Nope. She's going to the bathroom. <laughs> Get me some more coffee, will you? That's all right. We can talk later. That's OK. We'll heckle you later, OK? You're welcome. Okay, so while they switch the microphones, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. We have Dr. Vicki Prince, who is the Associate Dean and Director of the Office of Graduate Affairs in the Biological Sciences Division at the University of Chicago. And there is one question that Vicki would like to ask all of you. So while we pull that up, if you could get your phones ready again. Okay, so Vicki's question is a multiple choice. Have your most in, your important mentors to date tended to be male, female, or a balance of both? There we go. Sorry, it took a little while. So it's the same, I'm sorry, the field, the address line will be the same for the whole day. So it will always be 22333. Three, three. And then those are your codes for the options. If you like male, 33517, female, 33655, and a balance of both, 33718. I love it when they start shifting. <laughs> so far, a balance of both seems to be predominant. All right, we'll just give it a couple more seconds. All right, so it looks like we have a really strong balance, and then men, and then women. So um, I will turn it over to Vicki and stop the poll real quick and hear what Dr. Prince has to say about all that. Okay, good morning, everybody. So I'd really like to thank the organizers for both inviting me to speak and putting together such a great meeting. It's really been very enjoyable so far. So our topic is redefining the landscape. And certainly my personal landscape has altered over time because I come from here, the Chiltern Hills in England. Just for the record, I am not Australian. I found out some people think I am. <laughs> And of course, I've ended up here in the cornfields of the Midwest. But my career landscape has also been redefined as I've moved from do, doing pure research towards combining administration with research. And I hope that um, through my recent position as a dean of graduate students, but I'll also be able to help redefine how we do biological science graduate education, at least to some degree. So what I'd like to do today is give you a whirlwind personal career history and try and extract from it some lessons that I've learned along the way. And I know people here are at a range of different points in their own careers and also moving in different directions, some academic, some not. But I hope there'll be something here that you can uh, find useful um, and relate to. So I was very fortunate to have a strong high school uh, science training 
in the state system in the UK and to go on to university to study biochemistry in London. And from there, I ended up here at the National Institute for Medical Research. You may have seen this building because it was used in one of the Batman movies because it's so hideous. Uh, it's not a nice building, but it was a great place to do science. And I was lucky to have a um, tough and rigorous, but ultimately very supportive advisor, Peter Rigby, shown some years ago here. Um, I remember as a student during a fairly typical graduate student crisis of confidence that Peter said to me that I had as good a chance as anybody else in the lab of making it in science. Now, that may not sound super encouraging to you, but you have to remember that Brits are not given to hyperbole. So, in fact, that made a huge difference to me, and I probably wouldn't be here today if he hadn't said that to me. And on reflection, it really makes me realize how important it is what mentors say to mentees and how much impact it can have, both positive and negative. And I think it's important to be aware of that. So armed with that confidence, I went off to Guy's Hospital in London, now part of King's College, to uh, do developmental biology research with Andrew Lumsden. So I had no background in developmental biology, but it was what became my passion. And the irony is I've never taken a class in developmental biology, but now I teach them. So I, I hope I did learn some developmental biology, um, partly from Andrew and from being in the lab, but to a large degree from my colleagues in the lab. So I worked with an absolutely fantastic group of fellow postdocs while I was at Guy's Hospital, all of whom have gone on to have leadership positions in science. And I used to worry about how do you get to meet the important people, the senior people. Well, you just wait till you're old enough and your friends turn into them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> but really, th these people were incredibly generous and taught me a huge amount. So I moved on from here to a second postdoc at Princeton University with Robert Ho. And I won't say too much about Robert because, as some of the audience know, he later became my significant other. <laughs> but uh, I did really benefit from joining a startup lab because I was able to watch how a new assistant professor struggled, essentially, with establishing a research group. And that was very helpful when I did it myself. And I just mentioned another colleague who I started working with when we were both postdocs. Cecilia here was at the University of Oregon. And that's a collaboration that has continued right up until this day. So those uh, interactions we have early in our careers can really have knock-on effects that last for a long time. So while I was at Princeton, I received a phone call from a colleague who I'd worked with in London, Cliff Ragsdale, and he had moved to the University of Chicago. And he suggested to me that I apply for a position in the Department of Organismal Biology and Anatomy. I'm like, no, I'm not ready. I haven't published my papers. And then he called me again. And he said, you've really got to apply for this job because you're perfect for it, and they're not finding anyone. So with some trepidation, I did apply. And I came out to interview in March 1996 on a freezing cold Chicago weekend, my first time in Chicago. And amazingly, they offered me the job. So I know this is pretty unusual to have one interview and one job offer, and I was very fortunate. But I actually didn't realize quite how lucky I was, and I spent a lot of time worrying about whether I was making the right decision. And it was a long time because uh, I didn't come until fall 97 because I was finishing a fellowship. Pretty much as soon as I got here, I fell in love with Chicago and found that the university was an incredibly supportive place to work. So it was a, a great career move for me. And so I'm very grateful to Cliff for suggesting it. So I fell into assistant professor life. And uh, <laughs> it's a huge transition. And I think the one thing I did that was smart was I spent a lot of time before I left Princeton and once I arrived at Chicago asking people for advice and really asking for help. And I actually think this is something women tend to do better than men. I didn't view it as a sign of weakness to ask for help. I just thought it was the sensible thing to do. And nobody ever said no. They were all more than happy to give advice or to lend me equipment or even reagents. So keep asking. So I didn't end up flipping burgers at McDonald's. Um, this is my current research group, but I've been really lucky all the way through to have great trainees to work with. And the surprise to me was that I found teaching and training people in the lab was actually the most rewarding part of the job. 
So when I did eventually get tenure, I pretty much immediately volunteered myself to um, chair our Committee on Developmental Biology, which is uh, one of our graduate training programs. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was because I'd had great students from that group, and I really wanted to give something back to it. And I rather arrogantly thought that I could do a better job of administering it. And I based that on the fact that I'd run some regional meetings and they hadn't been complete disasters. <laughs> But I, I think it, it did go pretty well, and uh, during those next few years of running the committee, I really learned a lot about doing administration while not spending too much time on it. I also um, was successful in getting a new training grant for um, helping to fund the program, which was another good experience. And my own research kind of spread in different directions and let me link up with a variety of different graduate programs. So I understood how these different programs worked, and I think that was very helpful in making me qualified to take on the job I have now. So I'm Associate Dean um, and Director of the Office of Graduate Affairs, and I've been doing that since June 2010. Um, the experiences I had running one graduate program translated well into having an oversight role for 20 graduate programs, but of course this is a, a much bigger administrative role. So some of the things I wanted to do were first of all to restructure the office so that we could work better with the graduate programs and not have a them and us situation. And this is something that I think has gone quite well in the last two years. Another thing that's really important for me but is definitely still a work in progress is trying to broaden the training perspective. So to some degree, this comes down to changing the culture at the university away from believing that all our PhD students ought to go on to be research professors. I think that's a pretty unrealistic thing to believe, and we need to do a much better job of training people and exposing people to the variety of careers that they can use with their PhD. So one way we're doing that is to bring back alumni to talk about their own jobs and hopefully to provide both information and networking experiences for our current students. I also wanted to increase transparency and seek input from faculty on decisions, because I think people um, are much more accepting of decisions they don't like if they understand the rationale behind them. And that takes time, but I think it's the right thing to do. And having seen how different graduate programs worked, I wanted them to share the, the best aspects of the different programs. So uh, the challenge in all this for me is trying to balance the needs of running a research lab with being an administrator. So what, one thing I had to do was to give some things up. And the thing I gave up was my undergraduate teaching, which I have to say I really miss, but it was definitely the right thing to do. I wrote this down, and I think that's a really good idea. I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> 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 A general message, though, which somebody told me this as a new assistant professor, and I think it works at all levels. You've got to be really important not to let the urgent push out the important. So I get constant semi-crisis emails that I need to respond to. But if I don't take some time to think about the broader picture, and that can be in research or administration, then you never really get around to changing anything. So I, I really advise you to try and carve out a proportion of your time. And it's probably going to be 10% or less at any point in your career to think about the important things. And I'd just like to mention here that um, sometimes women in particular feel that they're asked to do too much service, probably because they're rather good at it. And uh, I also hear people complaining about women not being put into leadership roles. But the truth is that service and leadership are to a large degree two sides of the same coin. And if you have any aspirations towards leadership positions, then you really have to go through the service aspect. And the job I have now is viewed as a leadership position, but let me tell you, to me, it's mostly service. OK, so I'm going to finish with my top 10 tips on how to navigate a career. And of course, it's pretty much tilted towards academia, but some of it may um, relate to other careers. And here's some of the people who've helped me come up with these. So Mark Martindale, who was chair of the search committee that hired me, told me every day, just say no. 
And what he meant was do not get sucked into doing too many um, boring committees that aren't really important. And that was excellent advice. And I would go to the department chair and say, do I really need to do this when people would ask me to serve on committees? And a lot of the time he would say no. And of course, I'm grateful to him for having been supportive and, and you know, supporting me in not wanting to do some things. The corollary of this, though, is to do the things you enjoy, because you're probably going to be good at them, especially if you think they're important. So for me, the first of those was to volunteer to run the Committee on Developmental Biology. And the second was to take on uh, establishing a new undergraduate course for students who come in with a grade five in advanced placement biology. And I was supported in this by Jose Quintans, the master of the college. And these are fantastic students. It was such a pleasure to teach them. But by doing these two major things, running a graduate program and running a core sequence, I could say no to just about anything else. <laughs> so I really recommend you volunteer to do stuff you want to do, because it gets you out of the other stuff. So I've already talked about you know, the importance of asking for help, and I really believe in that. But I'd just like to say here that you need to help your helpers to help you. And I learned this from Chip Ferguson, who um, is a terrific scientist and mentor of many young um, assistant professors. And he read all my first grant proposals and uh, even manuscripts. But he taught me very sweetly that I needed to give him time to help me. I had to get him drafts early enough that he could give feedback and I could incorporate it. So do ask for help, but make sure that you ask for it in the right way. Cliff Ragsdale, he's the one who called me up and said apply for the job, has told me to practice winging it. And it took me a while to work out what he was talking about. But I think what this really means is have your kind of elevator speech about your research ready, because you never know when you might actually need it. Kathy Millen came in as a junior faculty member after me, and we worked together and had joint grants and published papers together. But she was the first faculty colleague who really looked to me for mentorship. And I realized that was a big responsibility, but that having received such great mentorship from Chip, it was only right that I would pass it on to Kathy. So, you know, be ready not only to be a mentee, but a mentor. I, I've learned the hard way from receiving it that criticism can be painful. And so I try to, and I don't always get it right, but I try to be encouraging to trainees because, as I said back at the beginning, what you say to people they may remember, as I do with Peter's words, more than 20 years later. So it's important to get it right. Um, be professional. This means a lot of things to me. I mean, one as a scientist is professional integrity. If I enter into a collaborative arrangement or agree to share reagents, I'm going to stick by my word just because I think that's the right way to do science. Um, Another aspect of being professional for me is interacting appropriately with all the different staff who work in your institution. It really frustrates me if I see faculty colleagues not being polite to the guy who runs the AV or the facilities people. If you're nice to those people, they'll be nice to you, and it'll make your job a whole lot more um, straightforward. Be aware that... The, you give out a certain um, you know, feeling to others, and it's good to have a professional persona. I don't think I've always been good at this, and I'm lucky that developmental biologists are pretty tolerant, so I was known more for my science than for my riotous dancing at conferences. But, <laughs> but not, not every field is as tolerant, and so just be aware that people do remember what you've done. Another aspect of being professional is um, building professional relationships. And you often hear people say, you don't have to be friends with your colleagues. You just have to work with them in a professional way. And I think that's true, because there's always going to be some people that are hard to get on with. But if you do have the possibility of surrounding yourself with a team that you get on well with, then that makes your working life so much more pleasant. So a nice example of this for me at the moment is Diane Hall, who's the executive administrator who I hired for the Office of Graduate Affairs. Diane herself is so professional that if she didn't like me, I don't think I'd know, but I like her, and that really <laughs> makes, the, <laughs> that just makes the, the many hours we work together more pleasant. Um, I was told by fellow colleagues that it's better to hire nobody than the wrong person when you're setting up a lab. And that's probably true, because in a small team situation, one difficult person can really ruin your team. 
So if you can surround yourself by people whose company you enjoy, go for it. I've already talked about striving for um, transparency and input and administrative roles. And here I'd just like to thank my predecessor, Nancy Schwartz, for sharing with me a, a great deal of really useful information as I took on my new job. Although I think it's good to be encouraging, you can't rely on people being encouraging, grow a thick skin, because uh, if you take every criticism personally, it's just gonna make you miserable. And finally, do something to keep yourself sane. Now, for a lot of people, that's gonna be spending time with their families. When I was an assistant professor, what kept me sane was training for triathlons, and here's the photographic evidence. I look so young here, that's 12 years ago. <laughs> This was my student, Dave Stafford, and postdoc, Ted Zeruka. The weird thing is they look more tired than me, but I think they ran faster. And although I don't have a number, I promise you I did do it. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, um, I spend my relaxation time riding my horse, and I'm gonna confess a bit of my career history I skipped over here. Between my PhD and my postdoc, I actually took a year out and worked with horses. And uh, that just taught me that I really liked science. So, I like horses, but <laughs> horses are better as a hobby. So I'm going to finish up here and just put up some pictures of all the great people that I've had the pleasure to work with um, in my 15 years at the University of Chicago, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. And I should just say that as that was kind of a personal narrative, I am quite comfortable if you want to ask me personal questions. <laughs> I just have a quick, oh, here it is. I, I just have a quick question. I couldn't help but notice uh, that majority of your students are women. And no, look at this oh, look. they're oh, all girls at the moment. The one picture you had was uh, there's, there was one man yeah. to six. So anyway, I was just wondering if that came naturally because of the... No, that, that is sort of an interesting question because the, my, st when I started, I had an almost all-male lab. And I kind of struggled with that because I didn't have any brothers and there was all this sort of testosterone-charged atmosphere that I had to deal with. And they actually almost had a fight one time, which I found quite terrifying. They didn't. <laughs> and then somehow that transitioned into the current group where, uh, well, these are both a little bit old, but, but still, this is the, the only man in the lab at the moment. And the atmosphere changed, and, and the challenges were a little bit different in terms of the interpersonal relationships. The women don't tend to physically fight with each other, but it doesn't mean they're always nice to each other. And I, I don't know why that happened, but I think when I had the male lab, more males wanted to come to it, and once it had transitioned to a female lab, the opposite was true. And, and both have been great, but both have had challenges. Hi, as you um, transitioned into your administrative position, um, how did you deal with your colleagues in, this, in the same department um, as you moved along? So I think my departmental colleagues have actually been really supportive. They kind of like the fact that I'm in the Office of Graduate Affairs because they're probably hoping I'll give them preferential treatment. <laughs> it's not going to actually happen, but um, it, it means that they have a, an easier means of communication to an office that they feel is very important to them. So I haven't had any kind of um, you know, negative feelings from my local colleagues. They've just been very supportive, although a few of them have said, you know, you're crazy to do this because it's such a huge job. But on the other hand, they've thanked me for wanting to take it on. Hi. Um. I, uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. It was a wonderful talk, and particularly since I've also been at the University of Chicago, I could kind of get the, uh, get the mood. I'm just um, a couple of small, small comments. When you were talking about uh, how important it is to be nice to the support people, secretaries, cleaning crew, one, one additional um, that all of us experimentalists um, need to be concerned about. Be nice to the machine shop. Yes. Uh, you depend on them. And if yeah. particularly if you don't give them emergency jobs every other day, uh, they're going to be nice to you and co cooperate, and you can't live without them. Uh, so that, that's one important um, part. 
Then well, you also mentioned the importance of keeping yourself sane, and that I appreciated very much because one of the things when I have my breaking days when nothing in the lab goes well, um, I, I have been going to the University of Chicago has lunchtime concerts uh, in the music department, and they last 45 minutes, and it's a fantastic, um, the therapeutic to, to just uh, just get out of the lab uh, and and uh, refresh yourself. And thirdly, um, again, this is a response to one of the um, remarks that you made. Uh, the students who uh, who may not want to be um, research scientists, um, we uh, with the Avis, and there are representatives here from Avis, used to run um, uh, a job counseling uh, seminar every year for for um, senior year chemistry major students. And in each year, I participated in it for many years, in each year, um, they forgot about the government jobs. Um, they applied to either industry or academic, but nobody bothered about, please consider, this is a very important uh, part, and they hire women, and they tend to be relatively nice to them. Um, you know, keep it in mind that the government does offer jobs to science yeah. people. That's a good tip. We will bear that in mind. All right, so our third speaker for this morning's session is Dr. Teresa Woodruff, who is the Thomas J. Watkins Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Feinberg School of Medicine here at Northwestern University. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this Game Changer event. It's really great to have been a part of, the two of this session and hearing the first two speakers. And what I'll talk today about is the science we've been doing in the area of oncofertility. And this falls into this category largely because we created this entire new medical discipline based on an urgent unmet need. And so I'll give you a little bit of a feel for what we've done to try and uh, um, uh, translate this work in multiple dimensions, from patients to clinicians, from the basic science uh, into uh, medical practice. So uh, I think our area in reproductive health is really critical to all of women's health. But for all of you in the room, that's not your particular specialty, but there are many areas that really require um, your particular expertise. And I think of the colliding epidemics and biomedical science of obesity and, and, uh, and uh, diabetes, which really are going to be uh, equal to climate change and the tsunami of, uh, uh, of health consequences that many of you are going to need to be a part of. We have silent killers uh, domestically, including infectious diseases that we often think of are a part of third world communities, but really are within our own communities here, even in Chicago. There are enormous pressures on the healthcare system and there is uneven distribution of care. These are all the major areas that each one of you are needed uh, in order to make uh, a difference uh, in the next generation. I think with all of these issues, there's still tremendous potential to really turn things around. And just as we saw the projections of climate change with, with the ability to move the line pretty significantly if we all get involved, I think in each of these biomedical areas, if we're all equally involved, we certainly can change the line and hopefully the health of, of all of us over the next generations. My own laboratory, I'm a basic scientist. I work here in this building, so I want to welcome all of you to uh, my backyard. And uh, one of the best things about being a basic scientist uh, is that you can come into the lab every day and work with extraordinary people who are also on different trajectories towards their ultimate developmental pathway. And with each of these folks, um, they can uh, know something today that we didn't know yesterday. And I think that's one of the most extraordinary parts of being a participant in science. My own area is reproductive biology, so just to get us all on the same page, I'm going to give you 
just one short little slide on some of the basic science, including here on the left what is my favorite ovary. This is a rat ovary uh, taken when I was a graduate student in the laboratory. And what you can see are all the different uh, structures that uh, make up this particular tissue. And these individual functional units are known as follicles. Each one of them individually contains an individual egg. And if you cut down right through the middle of one of these uh, individual units, you can see these structures here quite nicely. The outer rim of cells make uh, steroid hormones and peptide hormones, estrogens and inhibins that many of you are aware of. And nestled interior to this is a single egg, and that egg will be then released. And if uh, sperm are available within the environment, can be fertilized and begin the generational process that leads to uh, a recapitulation of that particular organism. So gonadal physiology really supports um, um, the uh, fertile function of the individual, but it also supports the endocrine health of the overall um, individual. The research themes in my laboratory really fall into three separate categories, the first of which is to really understand the endocrine loops, those hormonal changes that uh, are uh, initiated within the ovary and impact overall health and, uh, and uh, drive reproductive function. We want to understand how each of these follicle units are selected in a given month. Uh, we're very interested in understanding how follicles make the decision, and I anthropomorphize everything in science, uh, to um, move to the point where they can be ovulated. Women are born with all of the eggs we'll ever have. They sit in the ovary at birth, and uh, then uh, they are metered out over time in a process that allows a single one to be ready for ovulation uh, each and every month. So we're really interested in asking, how does one follicle, which is sitting in the ovary when a woman is 19, make that choice to move to the point where it can be ovulated, and one sitting right next to it won't make that process uh, uh, for 10 or 20 or 30 more years? In order to try and understand these two processes, we've developed a series of methods to try and mature the follicles in vitro in order to understand fundamental biology. And in the process of doing that, we began to uh, realize that this could really be adopted to a major unmet need for young women who had a cancer diagnosis, and that is, in fact, for their fertility preservation. So I had all these nice little diagrams to show you as I went through that. So um, from my career perspective, I think there have been really three pillars that underlie almost all that we do. And part of, part of this came from my training in, in the academy as a graduate student and secondarily as a postdoc in uh, Genentech in the late 80s and early 90s. So really having uh, those two fundamentals as part of my didactic led me to really understand that interdisciplinary studies really were the way to go, that we needed to involve uh, advanced technology to solve problems appropriately, and that we needed real-world applications, or that was really where my passion lied. Uh, in terms of taking this information from the bench and translating it into human health. So the particular short story that I'll, I've selected to discuss with you today is in this area of oncofertility. And this is really quite simply bringing together oncology with fertility care. So we know that there are a number of life-preserving treatments that have been developed over the last um, 30 or 40 years, uh, including uh, many new chemotherapeutics and aggressive use of radiation as well as invasive surgery that's increased the survivorship of cancer patients, not only domestically but around the world. But it is also the case that many of these treatments can also have the unintended consequence of causing fertility threats, including sterilization in men and women. So there are about one and a half million newly diagnosed cancer patients every year in the United States. And of that number, about 10% are within the age range when they might be thinking about planning a family or still rely on the endocrine support of either the testis or the ovary for normal overall health. Um, about 11% of breast cancer patients are also in this age time frame. And there are very strong advocates for ensuring that basic science continues to keep up with their fertility needs. Uh, back in about 2005, the real state of the problem was that there were options for men, and this was largely um, sperm uh, banking, but these men really often weren't told about the fertility threat of the treatment. So an issue for them was really education and navigating them to the place where they could have um, fertility sparing options. Young women with the same hope for survival as their male counterparts uh, weren't being offered any kind of fertility uh, options. And there were really three main gaps, an information gap, a data gap, and an option gap. And about that time, the National Institutes of Health came out with the roadmap for Anson. In fact, I think these were one of the most profound and innovative programs that have come out of the NIH in a number of years. And what these grants asked the scientific community to do was to tell us what the most intractable problems of our day are and how you would solve them using teams. 
And at the time, I was the basic science director for our cancer center. But it was really a basic, I was a reproductive scientist. So I think one of the reasons I was in that role was largely because of administrative skills. And uh, yet, I could see that there was this enormous problem that nobody was really um, working on. So um, the road to normal scientific discovery is, ulti is usually crooked. And the notion of the roadmap was that we could have a, a map that allows us to get um, from the crookedy, uh, crookedy road to a more straight and narrow road. And I think, in fact, what we've been able to do is we have um, made the road a little bit straighter and we can see our destination, but we certainly still are on that road. So oncofertility is the term that we coined in order to um, show this area of uh, work would be uh, important. And because it was interdisciplinary and because we really wanted to impact patients directly, uh, we also looked around for a ribbon that would represent this area. And so um, when I went online to look for all the ribbons, it turns out that all the colors had been taken back in 2005. <laughs> so I had to think a little bit creatively and recognizing that this was really an area of interdisciplinary, th interdisciplinarity thought that we could really use two different colors to represent the, um, the area. So the little green is the spring green, eternal hopefulness of tomorrow. And the purple uh, is the deep resonant of person and selfhood. And we also have two different symbols within the uh, ribbon. The little dots here uh, are really emblematic of embryo, sperm, or, or eggs, depending on your particular interest. And these little dots sweep up into the ribbon structure. But our ribbon, as you can see, is slightly expected. And so this gives us really the iconography for a field. Because again, remember that nobody was thinking about this in, in 2005. So we really had to create from the ground up an entire area and get clinicians, patients, um, and our basic science colleagues all involved. So I'm just going to take you very briefly in a single slide through each of these areas. So let's start with the patients, which is really where we started. So we thought that, in fact, we needed to provide options um, in real time. And so for males, the real issue for them was uh, a non-issue. Uh, in some ways, it is that we could bank sperm very easily, so we needed to navigate them very quickly to uh, urologists so that they could provide a semen sample. And as you can see, sperm are available in large numbers, unlike women, where we have a single egg that's uh, maturing each month. Uh, every uh, heartbeat, there's about 10,000 sperm that are being made. And so there are quite enough around. When I tell the high school students that, that's usually a really good contraceptive. When you think of one per month and 10,000 per second, the <laughs> odds are really against us the egg. So uh, that's a really good comment. So for the men, we really needed to set up navigation portals. For women, the issues were a little more complicated. Unlike the sperm that you see flitting around here somewhat aimlessly, and that's not really a pejorative, I think that's true. What you, <laughs> these, uh, these sperm are really the smallest cell in the body compared to the largest cell in the body, the oocyte. And so um, uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of the um, uh, upshot that took us through the last several years, but in the last several years, we've been able to have patients delay cancer treatments when that's uh, uh, available to them, go through embryo cryopreservation, or in fact now egg banking. And this uh, allows many young women to have the immediate uh, fertility preservation option that their male counterparts do. We also provide adoptive services, and we talk about natural pregnancies. Not all cancer treatments are immediately sterilizing, so there can be options for women for natural pregnancy. But for some women who really have hormonally responsive cancers and have no time to go through uh, the hormonal intervention, uh, and they still want to have an option for a biological family, uh, that's where our research comes in. What you see here is a slightly larger cross-section through the ovary. And out here in the outer cortex of the tissue, you see all those little dots. Those are individual immature eggs that are sitting there in a dormant phase, again, waiting for their month when they're going to be uh, activated. And so the uh, interest of our lab is trying to understand if we can activate those follicles. And so for young uh, patients, they are given the option of egg or embryo banking. Uh, they're told about adoption. They're told that if their uterus is involved, they may have to involve a surrogate. And they're also offered fertility sparing experimental options, which is to remove an ovary to protect those immature oocytes. And hopefully our science will keep up with them. We've addressed the fertility needs by uh, developing a national hotline and a number of web-based uh, materials that really didn't exist uh, in the past. Clinically, we've also had to get our clinical colleagues on board. Uh, they've not known about this field, and so we developed a number of tools in order to uh, make them aware of the uh, options for fertility management, including an iPhone app called Save My Fertility. 
uh, and a, a network of care. When we started this, patients had to fly into Chicago from all over the place in order to receive their care. And while we love Southwest Airlines, what we really thought was the best care possible would be in your backyard. So we've set up now a series of uh, collaborating national physician cooperative groups that have the full uh, range of options so patients can now fly to a site that's more central and uh, proximal to them. The research itself also has to keep up now with the notion of really thinking about the patient's interest and not just about publication, which is really a paradigm shift in science. We think about academics as really going towards uh, tenure and towards publication, and usually fairly autonomously. I think that's a very old model, and I think we really have to get beyond that because I think uh, research has a lot more to offer society if it was able to, to, do, to do that. We've uh, engineered an artificial ovary using a material called alginate. It's a product of seaweed. And uh, it's a biomaterial that allows uh, biological samples to be embedded in it, uh, in these little tiny beads. And this was in collaboration with a bioengineering scientist, uh, Lonnie Shea, who's a, a good friend of mine. I didn't end up marrying him, but my postdoc did. So <laughs> I'll say no more about Lonnie Shea either. So we've been able to re recapitulate follicular genesis from these early dormant stage stages, and uh, they uh, can acquire some of the hallmarks that you saw in that early follicle with an antrum and an oocyte over here. These follicles are growing in three dimensions, which is why after a while you lose sight of the oocyte shown here. Uh, importantly, we've been able through this technology to get to live healthy birth in, in rodents, and so you see the eggs that have been matured, and these were my favorite, favorite pups of all times. These were the first ones, I called them newborn and new age. We then had knew this and knew that, and then I was not allowed to name any more pups. <laughs> I am allowed to name the next monoovulatory species, whether it's a cow or if it's a, a monkey, so uh, stay tuned for that work. In the human, as I said, we, um, if a patient really has no options and no time, uh, or if they're a child uh, younger than uh, 16 years of age, the only option really is to take out an ovary. And in that case, we preserve 80% of the tissue for the patient's later use in a bank, and we ask them to donate 20% to the research effort that we think is going to make that other 20, uh, other 80% useful. And using this technology, we've been able to get human follicles to grow, and we have fairly high quality oocytes, and we're working on the last stages to hopefully make these eggs of sufficient quality to have uh, a real hope for these patients of a biological offspring. Uh, in the course of developing an emerging reproductive technology, we also had to think about areas like the humanities. And I think this was really essential. If we look back to what happened in reproductive technologies in the past, uh, Louise Brown was born into a world that really didn't know she was even being gestated. And so we decided that from the very beginning, we needed to involve all of the areas of scholarship, including law, ethics, uh, et cetera. And so we have a religious council, we have ethical discussion, we have historical context. And this requires us as basic scientists to really ask hard questions about financing, legal issues, life and death, public interest. And all of these things really come in at the basic science level in a way that if you invite them in, allows you to do your work, I think, in a more principled way. Education is something that we're very invested in, bringing high school students in from the community. And everybody thinks that hormones are really complex, and I can't really think about them. But they can be taught. And in fact, these are two of our students uh, who've been in our high school program, one of whom, Nicole Miles, is graduating this weekend from Smith. And I'm going in for her graduation. We uh, educate at all levels, and we educate both sexes. So we make sure that everybody is involved in the process of follicle development in some way. We also have expanded this from the laboratory-based work to over 1,300 students here in Chicago and around the nation in this curriculum that we've uh, uh, developed called New Bio. And our hope is to develop the next generation of clinicians, scientists, and leaders because we think that the pipeline has to be full and has to be diverse in order to solve all the problems that I described at the beginning. So by integrating patients and clinicians, basic research, ethics and humanities, uh, and education into one continuum, we think we can be game changers along the way. So um, I started, I think I skipped over the hypothesis that I had at the very beginning, but advances in first, uh, so what I was trying to do was build to this hypothesis, but the idea is that we really need well-trained um, individuals who understand reproductive health, and I think investment in the next generation of innovators will improve the, all, the health of all women everywhere. So I'm looking forward to um, seeing where all of you uh, uh, go, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, continuing the work in the 
path that we're on. And I think that when oncologists and fertility specialists together with all of the integrated sciences that I described work together, we can really change a devastating diagnosis into a life-affirming series of interventions. With that, again, I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. were maybe the, some of the turning points or milestones that you encountered in your career that brought you to where you are today? I think, so for me, the very first turning point was making the decision to move from a um, graduate career in the academy to uh, industry. And that was, uh, this was in the 80s, so a time when industry was not really a destination. This was actually the place that you went if you know, people thought you didn't, you wanted to make money and you never really wanted to be a serious scientist. Um, but I went because I was, uh, as I, uh, I was following my molecules. The work that I was doing on an endocrine hormone was, I had cloned it and I had done all the work with it, but now they had it in, uh, produced in enough amounts that I could do some work with. So I really followed that track not because of a, of a, it wasn't a stepping stone from academia to industry, it was because that's where my intellectual interests lied. And so I stayed there for about six years and um, Genentech was bought out by Roche and so at that time I could reevaluate, is my scientific passion still here or is it really lie in kind of hypothesis-based experimental studies. And so the next paradigm for me, or the next big breaking point, was to make the decision to come back from, the, from industry to uh, the academy. And as hard as you know, it was for people to get their arms around the first decision, it was very hard for the second decision because they really thought uh, scientists in industry had no brain. They only had pocketbooks. And so uh, I was able to make the case that um, I would be a good scientist, that I could compete for grants. And, and now there's a lot more back and forth between uh, the academy and industry. But I think those were two pivotal points along my career trajectory. And then uh, since then, I've largely risen through the ranks in the ordinary way, through service and publications, et cetera. All right, with that, let's give Dr. Woodruff another hand. So we have about 10 to 12 more minutes, and this is a time for all of you to ask questions that you might have of any of our panelists from this morning. It's been a really exciting morning. Um, we've heard quite a bit of diversity, both in the content area and experiences of our presenters. So if you have questions for any individual presenter in particular, please feel free to address it to the individual. Um, if it's for the entire panel, you're free to do that as well. And just Get cl really close to the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Just when you ask, really we're, close. Yeah. We're, we're recording, so we want to make sure we capture everything. Good morning. Um, this this question is actually for Dr. Prince. Um, if you could tr let us know how you how you handle or you would handle. Um, uh, climate in labs for graduate students. Um, we had a, um, I had a good conversation last night with some graduate students, um, and somebody made a question, had a, a question at yesterday's reception about how to handle sexist comments as a graduate student from fellow graduate students. Um, and so, as someone who is supposed to be rallying all of the graduate programs at Chicago. Um, how, how would you address those sorts of things? What kind of strategies would you give graduate students who are here who are experiencing a very hostile climate in their labs? Wow, that, that is not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I have to say that I hope that that's relatively rare nowadays, that people deal with these issues less frequently than they used to, but that doesn't mean, of course, that it's completely gone away. Um, you know, I, I, I think part of the answer that we had last night w was the right one, which is to address it at some level with humor, to protect yourself. And if you can make the people who are being, you know, essentially annoying to you, if you can make them look bad or stupid, that's probably the most effective way <laughs> of, of getting them to stop doing it. Um, but the, there may come a point when 
that goes on, it goes beyond just being a minor frustration and becomes real harassment. And every institution has mechanisms to make sure that that doesn't occur. And it can be hard to decide when that line is reached. But I think if, if you're really being made to feel uncomfortable in the workplace, that's completely unacceptable. And you need to find somebody that you're comfortable to talk to about that. And if you're a University of Chicago student, come see me about it. But uh, sometimes the immediate faculty advisor may not be the person you feel most comfortable telling about s such an issue. And, and you need to kind of seek out the right support mechanisms. So I, give me a day and I'll think about this more. I'm sorry if that wasn't a great answer, but I, I think that's quite a complicated issue. My question is also for um, Dr. Prince. So as a, as a senior graduate student, I've looked back on my career and one of the things that I feel is lacking at the level of graduate school is a sort of standardization of mentorship among graduate students. Uh, I knew most of the people that I started my graduate program with and I feel like some of the best scientists picked some of the worst mentors and that that forced them sort of out of science. And I was just wondering if you had any comments on if you felt like that was also a problem and or if you could think of a way to, to maybe help some of these scientists um, get more resources besides just their lab. So, so the way we train scientists is pretty old fashioned in many ways. It's essentially an apprenticeship system. So the person who you do your apprenticeship with has a huge impact on your success. And I don't think we're going to move away from that system anytime soon, although I, I can say that one of the things that happens here in the States, which is a big improvement over the UK system, is that at least we have thesis committees. And that brings a, a you know, different level of participation from a group of, of faculty into your training. And basically in the UK, if you don't get on with your primary mentor, you're in big trouble because you don't have anybody else to turn to. So making a good choice about what lab to join is probably the most critical part of all this. And I hope that graduate programs and the people who run graduate programs really try and work effectively with junior students to help them make good choices. Because the interesting thing is, one person's terrible mentor is another person's great mentor. It's really about finding a good um, you know, mix between the two, uh, between student and mentor. And lab rotations, of course, help with that because they give you some idea of what you're letting yourself in for if you join that lab. But having said all, all that, I think we can do a better job of oversight from sort of program level and divisional level to try and make sure that students are being effectively looked after. But um, at the end of the day, there's always going to be some variation um, between different labs. And I think that's just a reality that we have to accept. So I have a question. Um, but I also would like to ask if our panelists could put the microphones very close to your mouth. I think it's a little hard to hear in the back. Um, so my question is actually for our first speaker. So for Suzanne, I'm, it was great to hear about the fantastic work um, of the Climate Action Plan. And I think I'm curious about what might have been some of the challenges and obstacles you faced, particularly in city government, in, in getting that work done and changing that uh, climate, if you will, um, there. Many of us in the room, I think, as you saw the original poll, are from the university environment and don't work much in government. But um, I think it would be great to hear from your perspective, what were some of those barriers and obstacles? And was there anything about being a woman that either um, made things more challenging or less challenging? Or what were some of those opportunities that you saw? That's an interesting question. Um, the first thing I'd say is um, I like to think that the stuff we did at Department of Environment was unusual uh, because we did engage community, we did engage research. I, I felt that, you know, who are we as government to be um, making these, um, taking these actions if we don't have the science and the data to back it up? I was always, I, I just feel that that's incredibly important. Um, so we had a lot of engagement from university 
uh, professionals and scientists across the U.S. And that was very helpful because it also gave us um, uh, some uh, gravitas when we're talking to people because we could say, this professor from Texas Tech, this professor from U of C, this, you know, we were able to say that and, and it gave them, it took away a little bit of their, um, their cynicism, if you will. Um, with, with the different city departments and sister agencies, and I, I spoke a little bit about this, um, if you don't make it accessible to them and sh tell them why it's going to help them get their work done, it, they just don't have time. Nobody has time, right? And, and everybody here is busy. Everybody is always busy. And so, for instance, the Sustainable Streets, we supported Janet by doing the calculations about how much water could be gathered. Um, we brought in different folks to look at the different types of um, high albedo surfaces. She actually, in essence, the city patented that process. It's being used all over the place now, but the city doesn't patent. So it's just out there to be used, and that's great. That's the way it should be. So um, you need to have teams of people that can understand what, again, your audience is interested in, what is going to motivate them to work with you. Um, sp speak their language, but also make sure uh, that what you're doing is applicable to the work they need to get done. I would say this is a related question, and it's for Dr. Malik McKenna and Dr. Woodruff. Um, we're currently living in a rather uh, volatile, I'm sorry if I didn't get your name right. Uh, we're currently living in a fairly volatile political climate, and some might say that um, climate change action and uh, experimental research related to reproductive health are potentially hot button issues. Um, have you encountered any politically related challenges, or do you anticipate such? Um, and how do you handle those? Uh, and how does being a woman influence that if it does in any way? Um, well, I'll start. I mean, I'll be political. Um, Rick Santorum doesn't believe that climate change exists, right? Um, a lot of, it, it, it's a constant research conversation. I, I believe that the majority of, of scientists, I, I know the majority of scientists now say, yes, it does exist. The question is, what does it mean, right? And so, as I'd mentioned before, uh, I often don't lead I was here, I felt like it was safe to talk about the climate. Uh, I don't mean safe, but that people would be receptive. They'd, they'd be more this than this, as the Dalai Lama said. Um, so um, there are people that I do not talk about climate change to. I talk about um, where the economy's going, how stormwater is impacted, how clean and renewable energy is a great thing to invest in. You know, the types of things that are going to be most interesting to them um, I will say that our new mayor um, doesn't, um, I don't care if it's taped, doesn't care about this stuff, just does not care, and, and, but also understands the political aspect of it, that nobody, if you don't make it important to them, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. So he, his perspective is, you know, you've got these corporate leaders. If you try and battle them, they're going to bring out 30 more corporate leaders. You've got to find a way. Um, where, whether it's a lobbyist, a decision maker, or what have you, you've got to find a way to connect it to what's important to them, what's important to their constituencies who are going to put them back in office, right? So it's, it's about strategy, and it's about the awareness that you're going to have wrench throwers no matter, that's my favorite term, no matter where you work, and how you're going to get the message and the work that you're doing uh, to be seen as applicable to what they're doing. Yeah, I, I think it's an important question. Scientists used to be one of the professions that was most trusted, and now it's one of the least trusted professions. And I think what we each have to do as um, scientists is, is to have a message ready on any topic and uh, have a way to communicate that effectively. In the reproductive health sciences, you see this really changing very dramatically. And so uh, particularly as you're introducing a new reproductive technologies, one of the things that we really recognized from the outset was we needed all the voices to be at the table. Otherwise, even if we had the breakthrough we expected, we would not be able to make an impact on patients. And so from the very beginning, we brought in bioethicists, we brought in the religious community, and uh, asked them, what are the boundary conditions and why? And sometimes, I think, in this dialogue, what we found was that um, uh, the boundary conditions could be moved with uh, effective dialogue, but at a one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, we have, I'll give you an example of where we were able to take advantage of this. So 
So we had an article in Time Magazine, a very large, nice article, and the patient who had been impacted was a fabulous Catholic young woman. She had been active in her diocese uh, since she was born, was a teacher, and uh, she actually went through uh, reproductive intervention to uh, bank embryos. And she and everyone around her were so delighted she had survived and, and was going to be a mother one day. And within the article, she was quoted and her mother was quoted about how excited that they were. A woman in the archdiocese read the Time magazine, sent a letter to the, to the priest who then excommunicated this young couple, which uh, was because that, um, the Catholic Church prohibits reproductive interventions for Catholics. And what we uh, did was to counsel this young woman as well as to continue the dialogue with the um, Ecumenical Church Council, which includes um, uh, Catholics. And uh, we um, talked with them about what was happening on this individual basis. But one of the slides I passed over is we really have to think about individual needs and then kind of the societal constraints. In that particular case, we were able to talk through where are the boundary conditions. Uh, are young Catholic women um, going to then necessarily be sterilized by treatment and not have options? And so when you start talking about it in that way, it really changes the dialogue in a significant way. And so we've had very good uh, discussions, uh, and we have had young Catholics who have been part of the intervention, as well as other religious um, um, groups who um, ordinarily might prohibit against a reproductive intervention in this particular case. And so what that does is it opens up the dialogue even more broadly. In addition, there are laws of the land that prohibit us from fertilizing uh, human eggs for the purpose of research. Uh, and not only can you not fertilize, you can't activate the egg in the absence of sperm. This is a process known as parthenogenesis which would allow us to test that human egg that I showed you that was good quality to see if it would actually make a, a good quality egg. But because of stem cell, the stem cell community, um, and not because they did it um, autonomously, but uh, it's that whole dialogue has really co-opted in many ways the value of doing research on the human egg for the purpose of actually understanding health and disease, not only in women, but in all of us. We all came from an egg. And so um, we've written about this in science, and I, just as I answered the question earlier, I think it is being ready with an answer to communicate it effectively and to keep communicating that message over time. So uh, the 10-year uh, process has not changed, but it's starting to change. Uh, the issue of reproductive health is a hot-button issue, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. And I think all of these things are part of the landscape for science in general as we continue to have to become uh, and, and um, we have to communicate that we are an authoritative voice. And part of that is saying we don't know everything here's the limitation of what we know and don't know. And I think if we, ca if we uh, provide uh, the public with that and here's what we're doing to try and understand the next step, I think they're very willing and ready to go with us down that path. It's just if we talk in absolutisms, then I think there are people who will be willing to poke a hole in it, even if what we're saying is absolutely correct. So I think it's a communication, which I think I'm echoing what you said, and, and it's being present at the table and not stepping away from us being ready uh, to answer any question. I just need to add one quick thing. Um, looking at um, Vicki's information up there that, you know, the top 10 things, one was be professional. Um, you just witnessed me not being professional. I just want to note that. Um, uh, I, uh, I am still very unhappy that the Department of Environment was shut down. I think it was a kind of a goofy decision. Um, so for me to say the mayor doesn't care about something is incorrect. It's that it's not a priority. And the reality is when you have safety and schools and a terrible economy, um, you, you, you have to decide what your priorities are. And then you have to determine how to integrate the types of work that's being done to achieve those priorities. And so one of the things I always say is, you know, if, if I'm talking to a corporate world and it's about the economic stuff, I say, let's make that economic stuff happen. And if it so happens to, to advance environmental goals, great. So it's how it's presented um, and how it's integrated where it needs to be done. Okay. <laughs> let's give another round of applause to our panel. Thank, all, thank you very much for your expertise and a really great discussion to kick off our morning. We are now going to have a morning break. We are just a little bit behind, so it is about 11.14 now. We will meet back here to start again at 11.25, so that gives you about 10 minutes. All right, thank you.